I don't want you to pity me because of these chains and these bars that you see here. This is not the first time that I have suffered for his name. I've been flogged, I've been beaten, I've been shipwrecked many times for the name of my Lord. And though this is not the first time I've been in prison, my spirit tells me that it may be my last. But don't weep for me, for I'm freer here than I've ever been in my life before. My name is Paul. I was born Saul in the Roman city of Tarsus, the province of Cilicia. My parents were from Gishala in Galilee. My father was a tent maker. In fact, he was the finest tent maker in all that region. He employed many uh, craftsmen and artisans, and we lived a very comfortable life. From a very young age, I learned my father's craft in tent making. I learned to sew a tight and straight seam. My father saw to that. In fact, you could say that my life has been lived for many years in trying to be obedient to God like one of those tight, straight seams on my father's tents. I learned my father's craft from a young age. As I said, I learned to make a tent light enough to pack on a camel and strong enough to withstand the desert winds. I learned all of this and more, yet my great love, even as a boy, was never in tents. It was always in the Torah, the law of God. How I loved to hear the law read, even as a young boy in the synagogues. I think my father saw from a very early age that I was not destined for to be a merchant or a craftsman, but a scholar, to do great things for God. Our city, Tarsus, was known as Little Athens because of the great schools of Greek, philosophy, and literature there, and my father enrolled me in all of them. But as a Jew, my true education came in the synagogue, studying the law of God, and I devoured my lessons. And it soon became evident that I was going to need more teachers, new teachers. And for that, there's really only one place to go, Jerusalem. I'll never forget the time my father took me to see the holy city for the first time. I was only 12 years old. I recall standing on those steps, staring up wide-eyed, my mouth open. It wasn't just the sheer size of the columns and the courtyards that awed me. It was the fact that this was the place of sacrifice for sin, where atonement was made for God's people's sins. This was the house of God. This, of course, was long before I met him, who was our perfect sacrifice, the one who showed me that the Most High does not dwell in temples made by human hands, but in the hearts of his people by his spirit. Yet even then, as a young boy, I wanted to be at the center of what God was doing. That's always been my passion. Even in my youth, I wanted to learn as much as I could about God's law and his ways. And it was on this very trip to Jerusalem as a 12-year-old boy that my father introduced me to the man who was to become my teacher for the next decade of my life. His name was Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a Pharisee, a keeper of the law, one set apart to preserve and protect Israel's greatest possession, the Torah, the law of God. Gamaliel was... A true son of Abraham, if ever there was one. A devout and faithful man. In fact, you could say as a young boy, he was everything I wanted to be. Yet, we were very different, my teacher and I. Gamaliel was content with a life of quiet study, teaching, and obedience. And as much as I loved to study, I wanted action. I was a young man of passion, impatient, sometimes even arrogant. I wanted to do great things for God, and that is just what I set out to do. You see, my education in Greek philosophy, literature, and in God's law sort of made me uniquely qualified to become, as I grew up, a preeminent defender of the faith of Judaism. I traveled all over the region, lecturing in synagogues, encouraging God's people, the children of Israel, to stay true to the faith. I became obsessed with any new philosophy or teaching or movement that threatened what I believed to be the one true faith. And it wasn't long before I was selected for a kind of special assignment. You see, at that time in the region, there was um, a new sect within Judaism. This was not something new. Sects came and go all the time. But this one started, of all places, right in Jerusalem. A small band of unknown, uneducated, and relatively poor Jews had organized themselves around the teaching of an obscure rabbi from the back country. They even claimed that he was God's anointed, the Messiah. But the really strange thing was that this fellow, Jesus, their their rabbi, their master, the one they claimed that was the Messiah, had been crucified. I mean, he was condemned and killed right outside the city walls. 
And they were not the first group to believe they'd found the Messiah. The strange thing about them was they grew more influential after he was crucified. Most of these groups, as soon as you imprisoned, tortured, or killed their leader, they fizzled out. But not these Christians, as they came to be called. They seemed to grow in influence after his death. They claimed that he had risen from the dead and that he had left them to continue on his teaching and his ministry and his mission. Now, when he was crucified and I heard about that, I thought, well, that's fine. Another false prophet, we got rid of him, it'll come to nothing. But it didn't. Within a few months of his so-called resurrection, rumors were all over that region about miraculous healings, powerful preaching, and mass conversions to their cause. It was the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Council, that first arrested this Jesus and coerced Pilate into having him crucified. And so it was the Sanhedrin that selected me to put a stop to his followers. My old teacher, Gamaliel, he counseled me to be patient. He said, give it time, wait them out, it'll come to nothing as all followers of false prophets eventually do. For all his wisdom, he did not see what I saw. The situation was very serious. These Christians simply would not go away, and they seemed almost impossible to discourage. I mean, large numbers of Jews were joining their ranks. Even some priests we had heard stories about were converting, almost on a weekly basis. I knew this was no time for half measures. The teaching of these Christians was calling into question everything we held dear. The Torah and all of its sacred customs were being threatened, and this threat had to be dealt with swiftly and severely, by any means necessary. If these Christians could not be silenced, be convinced to be, keep silent, then they would have to be forced into silence through imprisonment, torture, even death, if it came to that. Indeed, it did come to that. The young man's name was Stephen. I'll never forget him. He was preaching in the local synagogues, talking about Jesus, and nobody could stand up to his wisdom, apparently, and I was sent to put a stop to him. When I arrived at the synagogue of the freedmen, he was speaking to a large, loud, boisterous mob, you could call it. Some were cheering him, some were jeering him. And I listened for a while before I arrested him, trying to find some technicality, some reason to put him in chains. He was remarkably courageous and eloquent. And though I detested everything he stood for, I, I could not find anything that I could get him on. But what did that really matter? He was an enemy of God, and I was there to put a stop to him, to silence him. It was no trouble for me to find a few men in the crowd who would agree to testify that he'd blasphemed against the law of Moses. I only had to coach them a little to keep their stories straight. But he was calm, remarkably calm when I put him in chains. Most people are, are vicious in defiance or pitiful in their fear, and he was neither of these things. When we dragged him back to Jerusalem to stand before the Sanhedrin, the very high council that had condemned his master to death, you should have heard him thunder away at the Sanhedrin. He lectured them on Moses and Abraham and the patriarchs as if they'd never heard of them before. When he chastised them and rebuked them for their lack of faith and accused them of killing the Lord's anointed, I thought the high priest himself was going to kill Stephen. It was all I could do to get him out of there and outside the city so he could be stoned properly as the law requires before that crowd tore him to pieces. I cannot bear to tell you the details of how he died. You see, for those of you who don't know, stoning is no quick or easy or quiet death. Yet for all the shouts of his accusers, all the noise, he cried out not in pain, not in anger, and not in fear, not even in pleading for his life, but he did cry out. He cried out to God, asking God not to hold this sin against us. I was indignant at the time. Who does he think he is, I thought. God's on our side, not his. I had no idea that God would answer this young man's prayer in my very life. You see, I did not see then what I see now, that the courage and the wisdom and the peace of this young man 
came from his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's no power on earth that can stop that. How I wish I had seen it then. I wish right then, in that moment, I had repented of my sin, got on my knees, and asked for forgiveness before Stephen died. But it would be nearly two more years before I would kneel at Jesus' feet, and then only by force. Two more years of arresting, threatening, pursuing, persecuting, and torturing Christians. You know, it's, it's ironic. Our prophets tell us to seek the Lord while he may be found, to call upon him while he is near. And yet I was not seeking God or this Jesus when he met me on the road that day. I was seeking his disciples, his followers, to have them arrested. I had gone to the high priest and I'd ask him for letters of, of permission to go to the synagogues in the region, particularly Damascus, and find any Christians that I found there who were stirring up trouble to put them in chains and bring them back to Jerusalem to stand trial. It didn't take much arm twisting. The high priest was only all too eager to get rid of this growing menace called Christianity. And so I set off with three temp men of the temple guard, letters in hand, the 150-mile journey from Jerusalem to Damascus took us only about three days. It was the middle of the third day. We had just passed that morning the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. The sun was so hot, we stopped to water the horses. As I sat in the saddle, I scanned the road ahead. And for a moment, I thought I saw a figure on the road. I strained my eyes and shaded my eyes, and the figure seemed to grow in size and in brightness. So bright almost I had to look away. And then suddenly, it was a blinding flash that knocked me from my horse. It struck me with such force. I say impact, but there was no sound and no physical impact, but it was so strong it knocked me out of the saddle. I couldn't see. I couldn't hear. Then suddenly, sounds began to come back to me. I couldn't move my arms or legs. I just lay there. And in my blindness... In my immobility, I heard a voice. And that voice changed my life forever. It was his voice. He said to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? At the time, I, I, I was so disoriented, I said, who are you? And he told me his name. He said, I am Jesus. He told me to go on to the city of Damascus and to wait there for instructions. I was terrified and sorry, but what could I do? I could hardly walk. I couldn't see. My companions put me back on my horse and took me into the city. For three days, I neither ate nor drank nor slept. I recited every prayer of the Torah I had memorized since my childhood. I cried out to God in my heart. But there was only silence. I heard nothing from God. Then, on the third day, a man came to where I was staying. That man's name was Ananias. He was one of the very ones I was on my way to arrest, to put in chains, and to drag back to Jerusalem. He came into that room, and he called me brother. He put his hands on my eyes. He spoke the words of Christ to me. And in an instant, I could see. I, I mean, I could see in an instant. I looked at it, and the first thing I saw was his smiling face. They tell me that something like scales fell off of my eyes when that happened, but what I know is it felt like a huge crushing weight was lifted off my heart in that same instant. As I said before, I did not go looking for God. I was convinced that my life was pleasing to God just as it was. I did not grow slowly disillusioned with my faith looking for something else. I was convinced that my life was pleasing to God just as it was. I did not go looking for God but he came looking for me. You see, I, I always viewed God as wanting to punish and crush his enemies. Of course, I thought I was on his side. And that is that I realized I was not on his side, and he came looking for me. I tell you, the moment my eyes were opened, I saw clearly for the very first time that what my true condition really was. I saw that everything I had been pursuing, a life of perfect obedience like those tight, straight seams of my father's tents. A life pleasing to God but in my own strength. A life of study and devotion and zeal. All my zeal for the Lord, all my study, all my labor counted for nothing. In an instant, I saw it for what it was. Compared to Jesus, a steaming pile of filth. All the righteousness I thought I had built up for myself by my perfect obedience. 
was useless, less than useless. I realized then, and I know now, there is no righteousness, no way to be right with God apart from faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know if you can possibly imagine what this was like for me, a faithful Jew, a Hebrew, a Pharisee. I felt both sickening horror at how misguided and sinful my life really was, to see in an instant how wrong I was, and yet at the same time, this overwhelming sense of joy at the grace of Jesus for me, that God would come looking for me. All my, my effort had not brought me closer to God, but farther from him, and he pursued me, even when I was his enemy. Me, of all people, an ignorant, angry, enemy of God. How incomprehensible is the love of Jesus that he would pursue me in that state and forgive me while I was a sinner and far from him. I don't know if you know what it's like to be forgiven by Jesus, to have your eyes open to your true condition, to see your sin, and in the same instant, to see his love for you. But if it can happen to me, friends, it can happen to any of you. Well, soon after my eyes were opened, I was baptized. By the Christians, I was on my way to imprison. <laughs> and I want to tell anybody who would listen about this Jesus, this, this Messiah, I don't think I have to tell you that this came as a bit of a shock to the Christians in Damascus, that Saul was preaching in the name of Christ. They were a little reluctant to trust me after all the friends of theirs that I had imprisoned over the years. But nobody could deny that something had happened to me. I mean, I was a different man than I was before. And so I went about preaching as often as I could, telling the story of Christ's love and forgiveness for me, connecting him to all my learning from the Torah, that he truly was the Messiah. And it wasn't long before not just the Christians heard about this, but the Jews in that city also heard. And they went from curious about Saul, their defender, to furious at who I was and what I was doing. And soon, the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders in that region, devised a plot to get rid of me. What a perfect picture of God's mercy and love that it was my new Christian brothers and sisters that first warned me about this plot and helped me escape. The ones I was on my way to imprison were setting me free. I went back to Jerusalem, and immediately I sought out those that I had been persecuting all those years. I mean, I had sought them out before. This time I sought them out to ask their forgiveness and to tell them my story. Again, they were reluctant to trust me. I told them about what had happened to me on Damascus Road, but I could not convince them until a man named Barnabas, who was with me in Damascus, came and told them about how I had preached with great courage and boldness in that city. Slowly, over time, they came to trust me as we served side by side in the name of Jesus. I wanted to learn from them everything I possibly could about my new Lord and Savior. And over the course of the next year, God began to reveal to me why he had saved me. He showed me that as I had pursued with such vigor to trying to destroy the church, I would now work doubly hard to build it. As I had spent my life trying to discredit and refute the gospel, I would now spend my life defending and proclaiming it. My friends, that is just exactly what I have been doing for the nearly last 30 years. It has been my mission and my, and my joy to preach the gospel wherever Christ has taken me, wherever he was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. My Lord has sent me to places in the service of his gospel that I never dreamed of. I don't have time to tell you about them all, but early on in my journeys, Barnabas, the same one who had defended me to the Christians in Jerusalem, we were in the city of Lystra, and we were preaching in the streets, in the market, about the, the, the goodness of God and the love of Christ. And large crowds were gathering. And out of the corner of my eye, I stepped up onto this, this, this base of a giant column near the temple of Zeus, of all things, in that city. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw an old man lying on the ground near the base of the column on which I was now standing. He was obviously crippled, probably that way since birth. And he was staring right at me, and his eyes were so intent, I felt the Spirit of God say to me, speak to him. Before I thought out what I was doing, I told him to get up and walk. 
Even as I said it, I wondered what I was doing. Some in the crowd scoffed and laughed at my suggestion to this man. They knew him as a cripple. He got up. Not, he did not just get up as an old man on unsteady legs that hadn't been used in years. That man jumped to his feet like a young man ready for a race. Everyone, there was a collective gasp, and then the crowd went crazy. It was chaos, waving their hands, cheering, shouting, screaming, pointing at me and at Barnabas, and some of them started calling us gods. In fact, they started lifting up Barnabas, calling him Zeus, and me Hermes. Can you imagine that? They thought we were gods. In fact, not only that, there was a priest in the temple who heard about the commotion and came out and thought we were gods in human form come down to earth. He was organizing a sacrifice of bulls and the altar to Zeus. This was more than I could stand. I started shouting at the top of my lungs for everyone to listen, to be quiet and listen to me. When I finally had their attention, I told them, we are not gods. We're men like you. Then I told them about the one true and living God and about his son, Jesus Christ, and about this God's great love for the world and the sacrifice of his son. As I said, I don't have time to tell you all of my travels and all the wonderful, miraculous things that I've seen accomplished in the name of Christ. Besides, I've written about that in many places. I've preached the wonders of God's grace in the Parthenon in Athens and I've, in the back city alley streets of Corinth. I've seen princes made humble and made low and peasants raised up and exalted, all in the, in the name of our Lord Jesus. I've seen entire cities repent and come to know him. I doubt there's a citizen of Rome who has traveled as far or seen as much of the world as I have, all in the name of our Lord. Yet for all the places I have seen and the things that I have done, my life has really only been about one thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has been the singular ambition of my life to know Jesus Christ and to make him known wherever God takes me. Well, I'm not saying my life has been easy in his service, far from it. But I've learned the secret, friends. I've learned the secret of being content in any circumstance, whether hungry or full, whether dirt poor or filthy rich. I've learned that Christ is with me and that his presence and his power in my life are enough to handle any situation, even the situation I find myself in now. In this cell, somewhere in the heart of Rome, you know, it had always been my ambition, my dream, to go to Rome someday, to preach the gospel in these great streets, to encourage the faithful in this city, to see the church flourish here, and to use this place as a springboard to bring the gospel to the farthest reaches of the empire. Well, God has brought me here, not how I thought. And in his infinite wisdom and mercy, he's told me in my spirit that this is as far as I am to go. My journey ends here. But he's also told me that the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ is only just beginning. There are countless millions more who will hear about God's love. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will someday return to judge the living and the dead, preach the gospel. Be prepared in all circumstances to give an answer for the hope that you have. Teach and correct and challenge and encourage everyone with the word of God. For it won't be long until a time comes when people will not listen to sound teaching. They will only listen to those who tell them what they want to hear. They will reject the truth and follow lies, but you keep your head in all situations. Stay faithful to the gospel. Cling tightly to Jesus. Carry out the ministry that God has given you. As for me, my life has been poured out. It's already being poured out as an offering to God. I have fought the fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished the race. And you know in my heart, I know that now there's in store for me a crown of righteousness which will never fade or pass away, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And it's not just for me, it's for you too, and it's for everyone who trusts in his gospel and who longs for his return.